Welcome to the Food Junkies podcast. Here, we aim to bring you the experience, strength, and hope of professionals working on the front lines in the field of food addiction. Our mission is to educate you, the listener, and increase overall awareness about food addiction as a recognized disorder. Here, we discuss all things recovery, exploring the many pathways people take towards abstinence in order to achieve a health-forward lifestyle. We hope to inspire you to thrive rather than just survive. So stay positive, make a change for yourself, and share your journey with others. And hopefully the message will spread. In today's episode, we discuss cheese addiction and explore Dr. Neil Bernard's perspective on nutrition and addiction, specifically focusing on cheese as a potentially addictive substance. Dr. Bernard's views differ from our usual stance, particularly regarding sugar's role in addiction and the effects of saturated fat on insulin resistance. While we have points of divergence, such as the role of sugar and refined carbohydrates, we welcome his insights. Our conversation highlights the value of diverse scientific perspectives in understanding food addiction's complexities. We know that sugar and ultra-processed foods are addictive, but what about cheese? Welcome to the Food Junkies podcast. My name is Dr. Vera Tarman, and I am your co-host today along with Molly Painshop. Today, we speak with Dr. Neil Barnard, a renowned physician, clinical researcher, and advocate for whole food plant-based diets as a form of preventative medicine and nutrition. He is the founder and president of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine and adjunct associate professor of medicine at the George Washington University School of Medicine and a fellow of the American College of Cardiology. Dr. Barnard has authored numerous scientific publications and popular books, including The Cheese Trap, which we will discuss today. Welcome, Dr. Barnard. Great to be with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you. What sparked your interest in exploring the link between nutrition and addiction and then cheese, as well as the plant-based focus? We have been doing quite a number of research studies that have examined the effects of different kinds of diets on various health conditions. Obvious things like getting your cholesterol down or getting rid of unwanted weight, but also quite a lot on diabetes. And along the way, we noticed two things that, that really grabbed my attention. The first was that the more, pe- more we got toward a plant-based diet, the better off people did, uh, dramatically better, particularly if you got just a total vegan diet, get rid of the animal products and keep greasy foods to a minimum, oily foods to a minimum. People did much better than in other approaches. That was thing one. But the, the other thing was, I noticed that when people would make that switch, from an American diet that had meat and cheese and so forth to a plant-based diet. They liked it. They found the the transition easy. They did well. However, after the study, a surprising number of people said, okay, now the study's over. Can I have cheese? And it was as if it was as if they had cherished their memories of cheese the way an alcoholic cherished the memory of a last drink or something like that. And I thought, what's this about? And so we started to discover that there really are foods that I believe we can use the word addicting, meaning we crave them when we don't have them. They make us feel better. The cravings are persistent, sometimes cyclical. And it's not every food. You might like a strawberry. You might like apples or bananas. You might love a plate of spaghetti, but there are other foods that really do act like drugs. And the beauty of understanding that is that sort of tells them what we got to do is we've got to treat them like drugs. Yeah. And if they're causing problems, then we've got to address that the way we would address a drug related problem. You're speaking to the converted in terms of that, because we talk mainly about uh, sugar and pro- ultra processed food addiction, but your focus on cheese. So many of us have an attachment to cheese and don't want to give it up. It's one of the harder ones, but you have a really interesting history of cheese and cheese making in your book. Do you, do you mean how cheese is made? Yeah. I thought, for example, cheese has been around since day one, but you say, no, that's not the case. Okay. First of all, cheese has not been around since day one in, yeah. in the history of, in the history of humanity. It, it started day before yesterday. Uh, There was no cheese until people figured out how to make cows stand still. Let me put it that way. Um, And that did not occur throughout all of the world. To this day in China and Japan and Vietnam and Thailand, dairy products are still a new idea. But in Europe and in maybe parts of the Middle East, people did domesticate cows. 
you talk about the industrialization of it, the introduction of obviously cheese is made by uh, fermenting bacteria. I remember you writing about how some of those bacteria are the same ones that are on our feet, for example. Yeah, it's bad whether it's done on a large scale or a small scale. It's but traditionally. Brevi, all the time, brevi bacteria are used, B-R-E-V-I, brevi bacteria are used. And yes, those are the ones that if you ever had a college roommate who didn't wash his socks for an extra special long time, you are smelling brevi bacteria and their fermentation products. And that is what is used in cheese making is brevi bacteria. And so it does make cheese smell funky. It's that fermentation process. And then rennet is used. Um, that, that's which, why blue cheese smells the way it does. Yeah, go figure. I, how it became popular, I have no idea. But then you have to add rennet, which is an enzyme that on the smaller farms um, and historically has been taken from a calf's stomach because the calf is there to digest the milk. And this enzyme, rennet, breaks. It, it allows the solids to coagulate. On big industrial farms, they use a genetically engineered rennet. And mm-hmm. then from there, uh, the milk coagulates into solids and you drain away the whey, which is a liquid containing lactose sugar and some whey proteins. And then for the longest time, dairy farmers couldn't figure out what to do with all that whey that they were draining away because they couldn't sell. And they made an amazing discovery is that athletes or wannabe athletes will buy anything. So you dehydrate the whey, which is a liquid, and the whey protein is a powder that if you tell an athlete that if they buy this canister of leftover (laughs) dried up dairy, leftover milk, that you'll get muscles. You can. You, it, it's amazing. They will buy it, and so you can go to. You can go online, and you'll see whey protein heavily marketed. It's just a cast off from the cheese making industry. All right, with the cheese, and how do we metabolize that in our body? Oh. Yeah, the, the cheese is about seventy percent fat, and that's absorbed within the first forty centimeters of your intestinal tract. So the fat goes into your body. It goes into our fat stores. Some of it, unfortunately, goes into our liver cells and some goes into our muscle cells. And those particles of fat cause insulin resistance, which leads to diabetes and other problems. But there's a lot of cholesterol in it as well, which adds, part of it adds to our circulating cholesterol, part of it doesn't, isn't absorbed. And that contributes to all the problems that we know are related to cholesterol, of course. There's a huge amount of sodium that is absorbed as well and raises our blood pressure. But the amazing part about cheese and dairy in general, but especially cheese, the amazing thing are casomorphins. Casein, C A S E I N, are proteins in milk products, and they break apart in your digestive tract to release small peptides. A peptide is just a chain of amino acids, the protein building blocks. So this huge long protein chain is broken apart into short chains and they go from the gut into the bloodstream and travel up to the brain and they attach to the surface of the brain on receptors, which are called mu receptors. And they're the same ones that fentanyl or heroin or any narcotic would attach to. And they have a narcotic action. They're not nearly as strong. One of them is called morphoseptin and it has about... About one tenth the receptor binding power compared to pharmacy grade morphine. And it's not enough to get you arrested, but it is enough to make you love cheese. Oh, so, cheese has a nice effect. It's a comfort food. Sure. Like heroin yeah. is a comfort too. So you're saying about one tenth. I was actually interested in that proportionate sense. So if you were to eat 10 times the amount of cheese, that might be the equivalent to a Percocet that you might get from the pharmacy. Yes, you're getting a whole cocktail. Um, there are yeah. many different. <laughs> casomorphins all in the cheese. And the morphoseptin is one that's been studied a lot. It's a four amino acid uh, peptide that is particularly potent. And you you get a whole bunch of these and you will notice the effects in two ways. Um, One is just, does your brain like it? And do you argue to keep having it? And do you miss it when it's gone? That kind of stuff. But your gut has a reaction to it as well. Many people have noticed that if they lingered a little too long on the cheese buffet and had too much, the next day they're constipated. Yes. As if you had surgery and they gave you a narcotic as a, a painkiller, like Demerol, after the surgery and the next day, oh my God, your, your gut is all locked up. That's simply a narcotic effect that happens all the time. I find that an interesting connection. I've never connected those thoughts. In the same way as a narcotic will cause constipation because of local effects on the, the gut, uh, cheese does exactly the same thing for the same reason. It's funny to, to imagine that cheese could be a drug. But that's true of lots of addicting things. Think of alcohol. A glass of wine started out life as a grape growing on a vine, never thinking that technology and the use of bacteria again 
through fermentation could cause it to become a psychoactive substance. But humans are creative and we find ways to turn coca leaves and poppies and grapes and grains and all kinds of things into things that make us feel differently. So using that analogy, if I wanted to make potent alcohol instead of beer, I will make whiskey. Can we do the same with uh, cheese? Can we make potent cheese compared to less potent? It starts out as milk, which has narcotics in it as well. There's casein in milk. And so when a person drinks a glass of milk or eats some ice cream, they're getting the less potent source of casomorphins. When you make milk into cheese, you're discarding the whey proteins you're discarding all the lactose sugar, you're discarding all the water, and you're concentrating the fat and the casein protein. So that's why I view cheese as dairy crack, if I can use that word. It's because you've greatly concentrated the part that's addictive. And they do one other thing. We like salty foods. People have a taste for salty foods. And you could say that's maybe natural because salt is, sodium is relatively uncommon in nature. And so we always have our antennae up to have it. And so salt is used in cheese making to a remarkable degree. There's more salt in cheese than there is in potato chips, for example, ounce per ounce. But although we like salt, we like it best when it's mixed with fat. For some reason, we prefer salt mixed with fat. We prefer sugar mixed with fat. That's why French fries or potato chips or onion rings are particularly uh, attractive to a lot of people and they crave these kinds of things. They don't want it just to a carton of Morton salt. They want salty, greasy, fried things consumed in that way. And cheese has a huge amount of salt and a huge amount of fat combined along with the casomorphin effect. And that accentuates the addictive capacity of it. Does the, like, the more smelly cheese, what we would call strong cheese, is that even more potentiated or is that just a different bacteria? I wish I knew. I, I have never quite understood that. And by example, you look, say, at a bar. There's a whole bunch of people asking the bartender to make their particular cocktail. And there's one person where it's got to be a spirits with lime or spirits with soda or spirits with cherry juice. And people very early on get their particular cocktail preferences set. And we see this with all kinds of things, with tobacco. And nicotine is the active ingredient, but people don't want nicotine. They want nicotine mixed with menthol or some other flavor. Why we want to flavor up the addictive substance, I don't know. But whether it's sugar, nobody just eats pure sugar. It's always in a cocktail. Nobody has pure alcohol. Nobody has pure casomorphin. And I am assuming that is because our neurological structure is looking for cues to identify where the addictive substance is found. And those cues guide them to it and are reinforcing in and of themselves. So that's, that's my dad. Be a smell, but I, for example. We wondered why that is. Now, none of this would matter if cheese was good for us, but it's 70% fat. Your average person consumes about 70,000 or 80,000 calories of cheese every year. And you don't need any other explanation for the obesity epidemic that we're seeing in teenagers and young adults nowadays, other than the amount of cheese that they're consuming. Now, I, I don't want to spend too much time because we could get derailed about this issue, but I do want to uh, just ask you, Dr. Bernhard, you're talking about saturated fat and fat basically as being the cause of insulin resistance, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah, surely you've heard that there's a, a lot of discussion about how it's actually sugar and refined carbohydrates that causes the insulin resistance. Can you give me your rebuttal to that? Yeah. Sugar does not cause diabetes. Neither do refined carbohydrates, neither do processed plant foods. And in fact, if you look epidemiologically, Chen and CHEN, Chen is a researcher with Harvard, and he and his colleagues in 2023 did a big analysis of the three Harvard cohorts, the nurses study, the health professionals follow-up study, and the, the physician's health study. They put them all together and they showed that, that processed foods were associated with diabetes risk, just as you're saying. For many people, they didn't look beyond the headlines. When you look at what the processed foods were, they did include things like breakfast cereals, frankenberry, and things that are all chopped up and sugared and so forth. And they included sodas, sugared sodas or artificially flavored sodas, and they included processed meats like hot dogs. And when they looked overall, they lumped them all together, you could see a clear relationship. The more you had of this group of foods, the more your risk of diabetes increased. However, then they looked at individual foods. And what they found was that the more you ate processed breakfast cereals, ultra-processed cereals, the lower your risk of diabetes. The more you had plant-based snacks, hyper-processed snacks, the lower your diabetes risk. The more you had soda, 
your risk went up a little bit. But it didn't matter if it was sugared or not sugared. Just the soda somehow was associated with diabetes risk rather modestly. And then if, it, if you looked at animal-derived products, your risk went through the ceiling. So in other words, processed foods as a group are a problem, but the plant ones are not at all. And other studies have shown exactly the same thing. Okay, but we like to point a figure of blame at sugar because somehow our mother made us feel bad about it. And we all can agree to beat up on sugar. It's a, a very convenient whipping boy, but it is not associated with diabetes. What causes diabetes is insulin resistance. I'm talking about type two. Yeah. Normally, insulin from the pancreas attaches to the surface of muscle cells and liver cells. And the, when insulin attaches a key, it opens the cell up to let glucose inside. And the start of type 2 diabetes is the buildup of fat inside the cell that stops that insulin key from being able to signal through the cell. The fat is glopping it up and it can't signal. And when it does, then the sugar can't get from the blood into the cell anymore because insulin's not working. And at that point, people say, see, sugar's the problem, that my blood sugar is going up. And when I eat sugary foods, my blood sugar will continue to go up. It will, but that's not the cause. The, the problem is the cell got filled with fat, it got filled with fat, and making you insulin resistant. Your body is designed to work on sugar. All our cousins, the chimpanzees in the trees, are eating sugary fruit all day long because the sugar powers their brain, it powers their muscles, but it only does that if it can get into the cells to do some good. Can I stop you there and ask you from the other perspective, because it seems like we have two different ways of viewing this material, that we would say that the sugar causes visceral fat, which yes, then causes the problem. It's the visceral fat that causes our uh, healthcare concerns. But some, there's a disconnect between, uh, you're seeming to say it's not the sugar, it's the fat that's causing that visceral fat. Am I hearing okay. you? Okay. Let's walk through this. First of all, sugar has how many calories in a gram? It's got four calories. If I eat any fat, whether it's beef fat, chicken fat, or extra virgin olive oil, it's got more than double. It's got nine calories. So if I want to fatten up, if I do it with sugar, it'll take me a long time. The second thing is, let me ask you a question. When you think of a person who's, let's say they're a sugar addict, they, yeah. they say this, they say, I'm a sugar addict. What foods do you suppose they're thinking of? They're thinking about those very foods that you were talking about, the cereals and the, and the chips and the, the processed foods, ultra-processed foods. We're not talking about the sugar in fruit or in vegetables. But let's say it's 9.30 at night and I'm a sugar addict. What am I going to eat? What am I going to eat? I'm gonna eat I think three or four things. Ice cream, chips, cookies. <laughs> I, we we work with these folks all the time. Okay. Yeah. So have you ever, I don't know if you've ever looked at ice cream. And, and where the calories come from, there is some sugar sweetness in it, but it's fat. It's The sugar is like a Trojan horse that hides the, this huge load of fat inside. Oh. Ever made cookies are buttery because there's sugar in them and most of the calories come from, if you look at a donut, if you look at just about anything that people call sugar, it's as many of the calories come from fat as from sugar or even more. If you look at potato chips, call that junk food. There's no sugar in a potato chip at all. There's a little bit of starch, but take a bag of Lay's potato chips and calculate the fat content. Look at the fat content and calculate the number of calories that come from fat. It's far more than that come from carbohydrate. So for some reason, we have labeled these things sugars or carbohydrates. They're delivery vehicles for fat. Okay. And I can show you, this is an expensive thing, but we work with Yale University's Department of Endocrinology, where they have huge magnetic resonance troscopy scanners and patients go in these MRI machines and you can measure the fat that's built up in their liver and muscle cells. And it's directly correlated with insulin resistance. And the reverse is true too. Let's say I take the fat out of your diet and I let you have as much carbohydrate as you want. When I'm saying carbohydrate, pasta, white spaghetti, or let's take a breakfast cereal like cornflakes, which don't have much fat in them, but I'm gonna take away the fatty donuts and all and the animal fat you the fat inside your muscle and liver cells is going to go down your insulin resistance will improve your diabetes will improve dramatically and it may even go away so we like to beat up on sugar it's a convenient issue but the sugar itself is not and never has been the cause of diabetes except for the fact that sugar itself does affect the brain it is an addictive thing and yeah. when it's mixed with fat like in a cookie or a pie it's especially addictive and the sugar draws us in, and it's the fat that causes the diabetes. We're going to have to agree to disagree on some of this, but I find your, your viewpoint intriguing. You're saying that sugar is just the vehicle for fat and salt, which are actually the cause of chronic diseases. But you will say that sugar is addictive. Of course. Yes. Uh, nicotine, yes. On that nicotine, one, I agree. Nicotine 
never caused a single case of, of lung cancer, but it's what a smoker wants. And the delivery vehicle for nicotine is tobacco. And it's the tars that cause cancer. Sugar in a donut is not the cause of diabetes. The sugar attracts you and affects the brain, but it's the humongous load of grease inside that donut that meanwhile parked in your muscle cells and your liver cells and cause them to no longer respond to insulin such that you end up getting more and more insulin resistant. And as time goes on, you're getting all the complications of diabetes. And I'm really glad that you raised that because the misinformation on this, or, or uh, just, it's not that people are intentionally misleading people. It's just that it sounds like sugar ought to cause a disease. But the, the misunderstanding on this is unfortunately really widespread. Back in the 90s, our friends at Yale showed that you could give people a fatty infusion in their vein or a fatty meal, and you can cause a person to develop insulin resistance within hours. I'm talking about one fatty meal. It's that powerful. In our studies, we have done the same thing where we give people a high carbohydrate meal and it, it doesn't have anything to do with insulin resistance. All right, let's get back to the cheese piece. You mentioned something about withdrawal, of getting back to the addictive component. What is the uh, withdrawal from cheese? There are a number of drugs where you do see active withdrawal. Alcohol is a classic case where the withdrawal can, can be so profound that you, I mean, you can die. You could, you see this with nicotine where people get jitters if they're big smokers. With some drugs like cocaine, for example, all you really see is intense craving. Yes, you're um, right. And, and with cheese, it's like that. You don't see people going into seizures from pelvic to withdrawal. That doesn't happen. What you just see cravings. And in fact, it's not even all that strong. You're not going to rob a bank to, to get cheddar cheese. But the difference with cheese is it's ubiquitous. You can get it at every restaurant, at every gas station, at every 7-Eleven, at it, uh, every friend's house, whoever invites you to over dinner. So it's this ubiquitous problem. And if it were more rare, it, it wouldn't be such an issue. So it, it causes this sort of moderate strength, persistent craving. Okay. You mentioned how, how ubiquitous it is. So that's the food industry. You do talk a, a little bit in your book about the practices of the food industry intentionally exploiting the addictive potential. Can you speak to some of those practices? The U.S. government did, an, by law, the U.S. government must promote American agricultural products. That's a law. And the USDA has programs to protect Ameri protect and promote American agriculture. And the dairy industry has been a big beneficiary of that. And in order to make that work, they have had programs, which I, I could show you the presentation materials because we got them through the Freedom of Information Act, where they say our job is to trigger craving. And they, they would say, what are we going to do? We're going to trigger the crave. Mm -hmm. And what they're saying is that cheese is addictive. Let's trigger it. And the way you trigger it is make sure that it's in front of people. And so the government, at the risk of sounding paranoid, it will make you feel paranoid. We requested government documents for their interactions with McDonald's, Burger King, Domino's, and other fast food chains. And the, the cheese industry did a brilliant thing, I have to say. They figured every town, they've got a McDonald's or something similar. So if you want to increase cheese consumption, you've got to be bigger in the local McDonald's. So the... U.S. government signed contracts with many fast food chains to explore ways of increasing the cheese prominence on menus and the content of their foods. So let's say you get a pizza. Pizza used to mean a crust with cheese on top and sauce. And now they'll put cheese in the crust and the amount they'll have is ridiculous. The amount, you could be a Michelin starred chef at a pizzeria in Rome and you would be shocked to see what we have done to pizza in this country. It's like yellow asphalt, a half an inch thick. and the farmers are thrilled with that because dairy consumption is falling when it comes to liquid milk. But if you convert it to cheese, it's rising really dramatically. Back in 1909, it was 3.8 pounds per person per year, 3.8. But does that include yogurt as well? That was all dairy intake. Wow, because the yogurt is popular. In 1909, this was not Geneva. People in Peoria didn't think about yogurt. You had to get to the 1960s, 70s, 80s before mm -hmm. Americans thought about yogurt. And now... We are not at 3.8. Oh, I'm sorry. The, 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 the 3.8 figure I gave you was cheese, but there was also liquid milk and others. Now we're at closer to 40 pounds of cheese, just cheese per person per year. Thinking about how pervasive this is, ubiquitous, to use that word, it's there, it's everywhere, it's in everything. How do we start to break free from this cheese addiction? What do we do? It's in everything. With every health issue. It starts with knowledge. 
And it doesn't require very much knowledge. The doctors in our clinic can explain this to a patient inside of two minutes. The patient says, why do I have diabetes? I don't want, I've lost three toes. My mother lost both of her feet. I don't want this to happen to me. What do I do? It takes about two minutes to explain how the fat comes out of the cheese that's 70% fat and it's getting in your cells causing insulin resistance. That doesn't take much time. Then has to happen is that it's good if that knowledge is reinforced as opposed to being contradicted. And then a person just has to try other things that are better choices. And there's a million better choices out there. You can go into any pizzeria and assuming there's not cheese in the crust, which most of them aren't yet, aren't yet doing, they're happy to make you a, a cheeseless pizza or half cheese, half not, if you're with somebody else who doesn't believe it. And you can go to Subway and they'll make you a submarine sandwich without cheese. They'll make you one that's totally vegan. Taco Bell will be more than happy to leave the cheese off your soft shell taco. So, so the choices are out there. So. Yeah. Uh, but it starts with the desire to get healthy and a little bit of information and trying out your options. Definitely. You've definitely spoken about plant-based diets as a potential tool for overcoming food addictions in general. Can you elaborate on any specific plant-based foods that in particular might be helpful in managing cravings and withdrawal symptoms that might be associated with coming off of the cheese or any of the other addictive foods? Oh, it's a great question. I think the, the foods that you replace it with just have to taste really good in your way of thinking. So what we'll do is if a person has health issues, like the typical thing would be I'm gaining weight just all the time and my diabetes is, is getting worse and or I've got hot flashes that are killing me. What do I do? So what we'll do is what we try to do is work really fast. We don't make baby steps. We jump in the deep end of the pool. So what we'll do is we'll say take seven days and just find the foods that work for you. So one person might say, I every day I have lunch at a Mexican restaurant. I have the meat taco. Okay, so I want to try the bean burrito this week. And what do you have for breakfast? Don't do anything fancy. I just splash milk on some cereal. Okay, how about if it's almond milk or soy milk or rice milk? I don't know. I never tried it. Try it. You give them seven days to try out their options for breakfast, lunch, dinner, the restaurants they go to, fast food places, if that's where they are. They come back after a week. They got a million choices. So that was easier than I thought. And then the next step is you take three weeks and you say, let's do an immersion where it's like quitting smoking. Quitting smoking is impossible if you have two cigarettes a day and you're trying to cut down, but it's manageable. If you say, I'm going to quit completely, but I'm only thinking about these three next three weeks. I just got to get through this. A short-term time frame is your magic. And so during that time, they'll find things that they like better than cheese. Cheese, much as we've talked about how addictive it is, it will give way and people find things they like just as well. And when they learn what cheese is, they feel sick about it, they, about its nutritional content. Many people do have a heart for animals. And frankly, I don't shy away from describing that. And there are a lot of people in the environment who know that a, bel a cow belching methane is no favor to the environment. So they just put those motivations to work. And after a month or so, they forget about it. So what advice then would you give to healthcare professionals who maybe are treating people who are not plant-based? Most of the people that we see in our clinic, in our research studies, have never had a vegan day in their life. And so it's like living in a culture where everybody's a smoker or something like that. And one has to understand the connections between the health problems that are bothering them and how a plant-based diet will solve the issue. Now, the person doesn't have to want to become a vegan and they don't have to believe what you're saying. There was a lot of skepticism about quitting smoking back in the 1950s. But when people do break free because they think, I trust you, doctor, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do what you're saying for a while. What they discover is very rapidly they get a reward and they discover that when they're not worrying about calories or portions or carbs or sugar or any of that stuff, but they're avoiding animal products and keeping oils really low, their weight starts to melt away, their blood sugars start to come down, their blood pressure comes down, their digestion sorts itself out. And it's like, these are the foods that were made for them. But the, the two things will happen. One is that, that they do need to expand their options. So let's go to a Chinese restaurant. Let's go to a sushi bar. What can I get there? Let's go to, the, to an Indian restaurant. Let's try that. Or let's go to the health food store and see what they're selling. So it becomes this kind of exploration of options. The other thing is you will have the occasional craving, especially when you are angry or hungry or tired. And, and we see this with any kind of addictive behavior. There's a word we use, halt. I'm hungry. I'm angry. I'm lonely. I'm tired. That made me want a drink, a tobacco, crack, chocolate, 
whatever. And, and patients recognize these things about themselves. And they say, damn it, I just fell off my diet. I gained two pounds since Thursday. And I don't want this anymore. And I'm going to go back to where I was. Yeah. So one moment for clarification and one question for clarification. Is there any amount of saturated fat that is, is there a threshold? Is there any amount of saturated th- fat that would be considered safe or necessary? Not necessary. The body has no use for saturated fat whatsoever. Okay. So oh. then, and I love like hearing you say you're going to maybe encourage patients to go and explore, try out these different restaurants, try out things maybe that they've never tried before. How do they avoid saturated fat? How do they avoid those like maybe ingredients salt, when they're out and about? Fat. Yeah. Salt, fat, whatever it might be that can make those things more addictive or detrimental for their health. What we're targeting at first As time goes on, they'll get cleaner and cleaner. But my first targets are avoiding animal products completely and keeping oils really low, any kind of fat or oil. And that's all. Um, So for the moment, I'm not going to worry about salt. I'm not going to worry about sugar or those things. They could think about those things later, but they don't need to think about those things for now. And that is a great relief. And what they'll discover is at the store, the entire produce aisle is filled with plant-based things that are really low in fat. Every fruit, except for avocado, which somehow decided it was an honorary something. It's loaded with fat, but every other fruit is really low in fat. All the beans, all the grains, all the vegetables, really low in fat. They can buy those and cook up whatever they want to. But they also look for substitutions. For lunch, I have chili. Okay. Instead of meat chili, I'll have bean chili. For dinner, I have spaghetti. Okay. Instead of meat sauce, I'll have tomato sauce. Okay. I'm at Taco Bell. I have the meat taco. I'll have a bean burrito. The substitutions make life really simple. But then there there are two areas where you can run into trouble. The first is manufacturers are never happy until they've thrown extra grease into whatever it is you're having. You're buying a bag of broccoli and they thought it had to have cheese sauce on top of it. Mm-hmm. But the, the foods themselves are fine. So you got to read the labels. The good news is you only have to read a label once to rule the food in or out. And the other issue is that res- is restaurants. Restaurants are in love with greasy stuff. So you're going to say, Okay, starting with my salad, can I have the dressing on the side? Or how about just balsamic vinegar or something like that? Okay, fine. And then we start looking for the foods that are lower in fat. That's a little bit of an exploration, but you can do it. Okay. Now, have you had any pushback on your book, The Cheese Trap, or on this general concept of cheese as being addictive from um, colleagues? Yeah, sure. People say, "How how can you say that cheese is so addictive? Why do I call it dairy crack? People are attached to, obviously, that's the definition of addiction. People are attached to these things. And yeah, people do push back. But of course, they all realize that I'm right. What about professional pushback? The dairy industry themselves know that there are cases of morphins and cheese. And they're the first people to exploit it. They, the, As I mentioned earlier, the dairy industry, DMI, uh, Dairy Management Inc., came up with this trigger the crave. They know that you could get addicked and they want to, to work with it. Do you, do you think for one second that the alcohol industry doesn't know that alcohol is addictive? They know it is. And their whole goal is to make money off that. And then they will say really wonderful things like, oh, know your limits and have a designated driver and all these stuff. The last thing they want you to do is to pick the alcohol free <laughs> beverage. They know this and, and that's okay. I accept that. Human beings have resistance and should. There's a lot of nonsense in the world out there. There's a lot of nonsense in science and in food science. And so if I'm going to say that that cheese is potentially addictive, I expect people to doubt that and they, sh- they should be skeptical of things. That said, what I have described is not even remotely controversial among food scientists. People know that it's there are all kinds of addictive foods, and these are invariably projects of technology. Okay, what's next for you in terms of your latest passion? We're doing a big study now that I got to tell you, I just love. We're working with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota, and their concern is not, they know that people eating cheese and meat and so forth gain weight, get more diabetes and so forth. And so we're doing a study to have a very large group of people, half of them go or one group of them go vegan and the other does not for comparison. But what they're actually measuring is not just do you lose weight when you're on a plant-based diet and do your cholesterol levels and A1C improve? They are measuring over a two-year period, do you come to the emergency room less often? And do you use less medication? And are you in the hospital less? And in other words, are you costing the health system less money? Because right now, a person with type 2 diabetes, oh, their health costs are $14,000, $16,000 a year. 
And we all pay that, of course, through insurance premiums or taxes for Medicare. But the question is, can we reduce that by changing what we eat? And anyway, to, to make this work, we have all the participants get together by Zoom, just in a conversation every single week. And my first question is, if a person is 75 years old, are they interested in doing a vegan diet? And the answer is an emphatic Yes, they love it. They're swapping recipes. They're talking about, what did you find to eat at Applebee's? What did you find? And your doctor took you off your medicine? That's great. I got off, I was on 100 units of insulin as of last week. I'm on none. They always are saying, why didn't my doctor tell me about this a long time ago? And you have to forgive your doctor because your your doctor went through school before this research was done. But we know it now. And our, our job now is to just make it easy and fun. Definitely. Okay. We know that we're at time. We have one last question for you. We have a signature question we give to everybody and then we tailor it to each guest. So if you could tell a younger version of yourself something about cheese or other types of food addiction, what would it be? That is a great question. I think that what one has to do is to recognize that addictions in and of themselves are expectable and normal. It's entirely normal for our body to respond to these things in the way that they do. And that allows us to be really quite forgiving of ourselves and of others because these things occur. It also empowers us to gently pry our families away from things that are going to hurt us over the long run. I might have encouraged my younger self to have made my the volume on my megaphone a little bit louder because... There are unfortunately large parts of our population that haven't yet heard the message. Thank you so much, Dr. Bernard, for speaking with us today on this subject. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. I I didn't mention through this whole program, but perhaps should, that I do have a new book out that's all about foods that specifically cause weight loss. So things like cinnamon or blueberries and many others actually have physiological effects that are amazing. And to think that you can eat French toast and lose weight is a really cool idea. And you can maybe get hooked on that. So anyway, th- that book is called The Power Foods Diet, and it's been really fun. Great. All right. Thank you very much for spending this time with me. It's been great talking with you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us this week on Food Junkies Recovery from Food Addiction. Make sure to join our Facebook group, Sugar Free for Life Support Group. I'm sweet enough. Molly and Clarissa are food addiction professionals who offer one-to-one counseling and group coaching through Sweet Sobriety. Please subscribe to our show so you never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in today's episode, we'd appreciate you leaving us a review on your favorite platform. Your feedback helps grow our show and allows us to reach others who need to hear this message of recovery. Don't forget to pick up a copy of Dr. Tarman's book, Food Junkies. And as Vera always says, The power is ours.